Welcome back to the program. I wanted to take up a range of issues, in particular on national security, border protection, the threat of domestic terrorism, with the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus, and he joins us in the studio now. Thanks for joining us, Attorney. Good to be with you, Chris. Look, I wanted to start off with the issue of border protection. We uh, we hear a lot about it, of course, in in terms of uh, the, the numbers that are that are coming into the country. Uh, the so far um, so far inadequate efforts to try and stem the flow of uh, asylum seekers. But I wanted to raise with you in a very sober way uh, the national security threat that the, these border protection issues pose. And how would you describe, how would you characterise the national security threat of, of, uh, of the currently poorest state of our borders? Now, we have detention, Chris, in Australia. And uh, what that produces is that everyone who arrives in this country as an irregular maritime arrival goes into detention for health and security and identity checks. And certainly a, a number of asylum seekers over the years have been rejected on security grounds. Well, it, there's two separate processes here. You are assessed, uh, as is required by Australia's obligations under the Refugee Convention, to see whether you are a person who is in danger of uh, risk to life or uh, a risk of torture or imprisonment uh, on return in your home country. And if you are assessed as being a refugee, you will receive refugee status. In addition, ASIO carry out security assessments. And we presently have in detention uh, some 55 people who have been assessed as refugees uh, who have an adverse security assessment. 55. And, and that's the process that uh, is presently being looked at. And there's a review process that we've set up with former federal court judge Margaret Stone uh, conducting reviews of the 55 cases. But this is a, a situation uh, that you must be concerned about because if, uh, if, if people uh, who wanted to get into Australia for ulterior pur purposes or were fleeing some, um, some consequences elsewhere, this would be a, a way to try and get into the country undetected. Well, they're not undetected. Well, That's the point. Uh, well, with, uh, a, with a different identity, I suppose. Uh, I think that someone who wants to come here has a range of ways of getting into the country, unfortunately. And uh, I think it would be an unlikely thing uh, that someone would choose to come in a leaky and dangerous boat uh, across dangerous waters from Indonesia if, that's, if they were intending to get to Australia uh, to do some harm. So um, the uh, Immigration Minister, Brendan O'Connor, this morning spoke about three current cases. That is uh, uh, an Egyptian man who's on a terror alert, a Sri Lankan asylum seeker who's a murder suspect, and an Iranian who's a drug running suspect. What's the status of these, of, of these asylum seekers uh, in, in terms of the legal consequences? Uh, will they be repatriated to the countries they've come from? Well, all of those people are in detention and uh, all of them will be assessed and have their claims assessed as Australia is required to do uh, under the Refugee Convention. So if they qualify as a refugee, then any of these legal or security concerns uh, will be dealt with by our legal system? Well, we have security assessments by ASIO, and as I've indicated, we've presently got uh, 55 refugees, uh, that's people with refugee status, um, who are in the very unfortunate position of having these adverse security assessments and remain in detention and they will remain in detention for the foreseeable future? Well, I'm not going to say, um, because for a start, we've got Margaret Stone, former federal court judge, looking at their cases, and uh, it's, in, it, it's a matter for continuing review. Well, obviously, it's a concerning situation, mm. but you're, you're telling us you have it very well under control then with these current yes. practices. Yes. Look, I just wanted to raise uh, the, the issue of the Boston bombings. We've seen, uh, of course, those terrible events uh, last week, the fact that this was um, a domestic terrorism attack, but, of course, mm. uh, seems to be, have uh, been predicated upon is Islamic extremism. What lessons are there for Australia out of this? So obviously, we're very vigilant in this area anyway, but you must have been concerned that, for instance, at least one of these uh, men uh, was drawn to the attention of the FBI, yet they were still, the American authorities were still not able to prevent this, this act from being carried out. Uh, there is a difficulty. It's been identified by many people since these events, and we've had similar events like them, where you get a murderous act, where you've got violent extremism taking place, and uh, people who have developed uh, their murderous wish uh, alone, or in this case apparently two brothers, uh, not in connection with any organised group. Uh, that does present security risks. That's why we have uh, very well resourced security agencies in Australia. It's why we have to remain vigilant. Um, just a couple of weeks ago I went to have my first inspection of the ASIO building 
which is uh, a very large new facility that ASIO are going to take possession of in the second half of this year. Uh, there's a reason why we've uh, planned and built uh, that facility. It's to make sure that ASIO is resourced, can bring all of its staff in Canberra together in the one place and carry out the coordination job that it needs to. So um, is this, is this a, a particular focus of ASIO, the, the idea of, of individuals perhaps radicalised but acting as individuals rather than uh, dealing with uh, broader groups which might bring them more easily under uh, the attention of authorities? Uh, it's both, Chris. Um, ASIO do look at particular groups of people. Uh, but they are also on the watch for individuals uh, where it is possible to find them. Uh, that's, the, that's one of the focuses of our counter-terrorism effort. Now we have had reports uh, in recent days and uh, claims that uh, Hezbollah, the, uh, the, the Shia terrorist group um, based in the Middle East, having active cells in Australia. What can you tell us about those reports? I'm not going to comment, as is standard practice for our government and former governments on operational matters, Chris, but I can tell you that the military wing, the ESO of Hezbollah, has been a proscribed organisation under the criminal code for some time, and uh, what that means is that it's an offence to participate in its activities, it's an offence to raise money for it, it's an offence to support it. And um, so that, therefore, will if our to, that will knew, continue to be the case. If, if they knew of any cells mm. here, would it be a simple, well not a simple matter, but, but, but simply by being associated with that organisation people would be creating an, uh, committing an offence in Australia yes, and it's, our it's, authorities would be onto it? It's already against Australian mm. law and uh, we've got some 17 proscribed terror organisations under the Criminal Code, um, one of the focuses of ASIO's work and the work of the Australian Federal Police uh, is that kind of group. You must be particularly focused on this at the moment with the reports also and confirmation in fact uh, from the government that we uh, were aware of numbers of Australians who have travelled to Syria to join in the civil war there, sometimes associating with extremist groups. What can you tell us about that? How many Australians do we believe are involved in the Syrian conflict? Are they fighting with extremist groups and will they be allowed back into Australia afterwards? Uh, they're Australian citizens, and clearly Australian citizens have a right to return to their own country. Well, not but it if, is for instance, they're associating with Hezbollah under, if it's a prescribed organisation. Uh, they've got a right to return to their own country. Whether they have committed an offence is a separate question. Uh, there's an, another piece of legislation altogether, the Foreign Incursions Act, which makes it an offence for Australians to go overseas and fight in conflicts generally, uh, other than as part of our, arm, our, our armed forces. Um, the concern that I've expressed, that um, the head of ASIO has expressed, that um, senior officers of the Australian Federal Police have expressed, is that we've got uh, quite a number of Australians going to Syria to fight or to support violent activity there who will be returning to Australia. Some have already returned and there's a concern that they will have become radicalised and that they will have learned um, techniques of violence that might in turn lead to them becoming involved in terrorist activity here in Australia. It's very worrying indeed, but uh, obviously this is of, uh, a keen focus and you're watching these people very carefully. Yes, and uh, we're aware of the fact that Australians have gone to participate in the conflict in Syria. We're publicly expressing the concern. I'd say to you, Chris, and to anyone that's watching, uh, we very much would say do not go to Syria uh, to participate in this conflict. If you care about the welfare of the Syrian people, there's other ways to assist. It's assisting from here in the humanitarian effort because on any view there's a humanitarian tragedy unfolding in Syria with some 1.3 million refugees already from that conflict now in neighbouring countries in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Iraq and in Turkey. Right, it's a very worrying situation. We'll move on to a couple of other uh, more prosaic issues now, I suppose. Uh, I wanted to uh, get you on a couple of issues that uh, we've seen develop this year that impinge on free speech. One was your anti-discrimination reform package and the other, of course, was media regulation. If I can take them separately, uh, the government has dropped its efforts to regulate the media. Uh, can you tell us here unequivocally that uh, the Labor Party then has put that aside, that if you're re-elected, the Labor Party will not again try to regulate the print media? Uh, as you saw, the Minister for Communications say very clearly that uh, proposal was being put forward 
and it was there for a short time. It was to pass the parliament. If it didn't pass the parliament, that was the end of the matter. I, I can speak to you a bit, a bit more clearly about the matters that are within my direct responsibility, which is this anti-discrimination package that you sure. mentioned. Uh, look, and, and that's more complex, but there were, there were some concerns relating to that, which I know you won't uh, agree with, about uh, its impact on freedom of speech. But uh, you haven't pulled that completely. You've, uh, you're looking at a review of those laws again now. Do you expect to put them before Parliament again before the election? Uh, my predecessor did the right thing in putting out an early draft of what is quite a complex project of putting together five acts of Parliament, legislated over over four decades, all of our, the whole body of our anti-discrimination law together in one law. Uh, that draft was put out for public comment, there was public comment, there was a Senate inquiry into it and when I received that uh, report of the Senate inquiry what I've said is that we will go forward with one very clear reform which is to add a ground of sexual orientation gender identity and intersex status to the Sex Discrimination Act that looks like it's going to be supported by the coalition so it's something that we can move forward on. That's in the parliament now and I'm expecting it to pass the parliament uh, before we rise for the winter and uh, the rest of the consolidation project I've sent back to the department to try to work through a range of criticisms that were expressed, including some suggestions for additional reforms that the Senate committee put forward. But we wouldn't see that again till after the election. That's often um, than ever. Well, ever. we'll see how it goes, mm -hmm. but I can make clear that the particular criticism, which was about um, part of the drafting, I think it was section 19.2 in the draft bill, uh, we've made it clear that that's gone. What I'm concerned about is the coalition's position that it wants to repeal the racial vilification provisions which are an important protection in our existing law, so-called hate speech provisions. Uh, that is something that I will be fighting them every step of the way and I frankly don't understand why Tony Abbott or George Brandis are so committed to repealing useful protections in Australian law which make sure we can't have extreme forms of hate speech. All right, two more matters I just want to get an answer from you on before we go. One is the uh, you'd be aware that the Victorian Fraud Squad are investigating the so-called AWU affair, which of course predates Julia Gillard's entry into Parliament, but it involves the uh, alleged activities of her former partner and others. Uh, have you been given any briefing, any advice about uh, the status of this investigation whatsoever? No, but I have seen that the um, Victoria Police have said that what they're investigating is the misappropriation of funds from the AWU. There's not the slightest suggestion of any involvement of the Prime Minister. She has completely denied any wrongdoing and I'm a bit disappointed in you, Chris, for bringing for, her name into for it. For daring to ask. No, no, no I'm not for daring to ask, but for bringing her name into this when the Victoria Police have said very clearly that what they are investigating is misappropriation of funds from the AWU. There is not the slightest suggestion of the Prime Minister being involved in that. And might I say, this bit of muckraking, which the Liberal Party has been engaging in now for many, many months, they've had plenty of opportunities to put up or shut up, including Tony Abbott being given the opportunity and squibbing it, failing well, completely right. to say anything that supported the kind of allegations that he'd been making. Well, this making. is not, not muckraking. This is me asking you a couple of questions about a police investigation. And I have mm. put some questions to the Prime Minister's office, haven't got them back yet. And uh, as you say, the Prime Minister has said repeatedly uh, she was not aware of any wrongdoing and was not involved in wrongdoing herself. And, and given but an extraordinarily as... long press conference at which she answered every yeah. single question. But we now have this police investigation. And I thought as Attorney General, I would ask you whether you've been briefed on it and whether the other question is whether or not you know whether the Prime Minister will be required to give any information to that investigation. Oh, it, this, is a, this is something that the Victoria Police are looking into. There's absolutely no reason why the Commonwealth Attorney General should have been briefed on what the Victoria Police are doing. There's nothing here involving the Prime Minister and I think you should be looking at things that are a bit more recent uh, rather than something that occurred 21 years ago. Um, something, well, like the the involvement, something like the involvement of Mel Bruff in conspiring to bring down the Speaker of the House of Representatives. That's next something that's back court in court next, there too. Well, um, back in court next week as it happens, but that particular fact of Mel Bruff conspiring with members of the Liberal National Party in Queensland last year, Chris, that's a bit more current Very, and that's something that oh, I think we should be looking don't, at. Don't worry, Attorney General, yeah. we talk about that as mm. well. In fact, uh, uh, the, the leader of the government business in the House sat in that very chair and compared mm. it to Watergate about the, uh, last year. Uh, just before you go, the, the leadership issue has been rehashed again in a, in, a, in a magazine article out today in the monthly. I just
just want to ask you the simple question of, about the Gillard government's woes. Do you attribute the, the, the problems of the, that the government's experienced over the past year or so to the government's own actions or to the alleged undermining that's occurred from Kevin Rudd and his supporters? I think that what we're going to see between now and the election is what politics in Australia should be about, which is a comparison of policy. Chris, and I'm very much looking forward to the coming weeks and months when we will have actual concentration on policy. We've already seen the first big rollout of policy from Tony Abbott, which was his so-called NBN policy, which has been shown to be basically a failure because it was second rate and people have rightly seen it as the second rate thing it is. I'm looking forward to a debate about how we deal with climate change, because again, we're starting to indeed. see some we'll, focus we'll get on, on that. To all those that's issues. that's yes, what indeed. I'm looking forward to politics being about, Chris. Thanks very much for joining us, Attorney General Thank Mark Dreyfus.